Hi, this is Margo Wu-Tan. I'm the Director of Nutrition Policy at the Center for Science and the Public Interest. And welcome to this discussion that we'll have for the next hour or so about sodium. Um, you probably heard news reports, food companies, school food service organizations, and heard about members of Congress who are calling into question the science behind the need to lower sodium in our diets. And they're trying to weaken or prevent policy actions that would help people to manage their salt intake. So for the next hour, we're going to discuss the evidence regarding the need to reduce sodium intake, why it's important for um, especially kids, but important overall for Americans' health, what's happening with sodium policy regarding schools, and importantly, take your questions. So we are very lucky to have two sodium experts with us here today. Um, I'm going to start with some discussion about what's happening with school foods, and then I'll turn it over to Molly Cogswell, who's a senior scientist in the Division for Heart Disease and Stroke Prevention at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And Molly's going to talk about the science of sodium intake among kids. And then I will turn it over, Molly will turn it over to Emily Ann Callahan, who is the national program lead for the Sodium Reduction Initiative at the American Heart Association. And she's going to help us sort through the science related to sodium. And then we'll get to your questions. So if you look at the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see um, a line for questions. And if you click on the plus sign, you'll open up a box. And you can type your questions into the question box at any time during the chat. So as you have questions, type them in. We'll wait and hold all the questions for the end. But, um, but hopefully, there'll be plenty of time to, um, to hear your questions. So, and if you also have any technical problems during the, the chat, you can type them in there as well. So as many of you probably know, child nutrition is um, a hot topic these days. And in Washington, and with Congress in particular, there's a focus on child nutrition via two different tracks right now. One is through the appropriations process, the annual spending bills for the federal government. And the other is through the child nutrition reauthorization, which happens every five years. And sodium has been a major focus in both of these, through both of these policy processes. So let's start with appropriations. Um, appropriations bills should be about funding federal agencies. And in the case of school lunch, it's the US Department of Agriculture. But it's very common for members of Congress to place policy riders in the annual spending bills. And there has been focus on sodium as a part of the appropriations process. Last year, Congress included a waiver in the House appropriations bill that would have gotten rid of all updates to school nutrition standards. And in the Senate, Senator Hoven has focused a lot of attention on sodium and whole grains. And in the end, for the fiscal year 2015 spending bill, there was a provision for state child nutrition agencies to set up a process through which school districts could apply for waivers for whole grains. And for that, there's been a mix of responses from districts and states from no waivers in many states to as many as 400 school districts applying for waivers in Michigan for more than a dozen products. The other part um, of that appropriations rider for school foods had to do with sodium. And what it did was say that the final regulations for sodium reduction, which were are supposed to be phased in um, for lunch and for school breakfast, that they couldn't move forward with the next phase of sodium reduction. So the first phase of sodium reduction for school lunch and breakfast started in the school year 2014 to 2015. And those levels are still pretty high. It's the first time there are quantitative recommendations, limits for sodium in school meals, but the level at which those 
were set for sodium are, you know, for example, about 1,400 milligrams of sodium in a high school lunch. So there has been a lot of controversy about that first target for sodium reduction. Most people are going along with it, School Nutrition Association, um, food manufacturers, and members of Congress, where the controversy has come into play is around the next phase of sodium reduction called Target 2. And that's supposed to go into effect July 2017. And that next phase of sodium reduction is still pretty high. You know, we're not talking about going to very low sodium levels in a school lunch. Um, in a high school, at Target 2 sodium levels, there would still be about 1,000 milligrams of sodium in a high school lunch. And then target three is very far off. That's a 10-year phase-in period that doesn't go into effect until 2022. And that's where schools, a high school would get to around 740 milligrams of sodium in a high school lunch. So still not low levels. All of these are based on a daily target of 2,300 milligrams of sodium, but it's just gradually moving schools toward that overall daily target and you know, breaking it up into how much would be reasonable to have in, in a meal. So the appropriations rider would freeze sodium at the target one level, the current level. And the excuse that some have used is that there isn't enough science to show that schools should go to a lower level. So this issue of the strength of sodium science is something that's being debated by policymakers and held up as a reason to not go to further reductions in sodium. Um, the House has proposed, both the House and the Senate have proposed the same language as what was in last year's agriculture spending bill for FY16. And so both the House and the Senate have come out with their bill and worked it through committee. But, um, but it's not final yet. For those of you who are interested in um, seeing what we're saying to policymakers or would like to reach out to your own policymakers, we have a couple of fact sheets that have been developed by members of the National Alliance for Nutrition and Activity that we've been using to educate members of Congress and their staff. One on the science of sodium, which the American Heart Association developed. Another with examples of the many products that companies have already reformulated to reduce sodium and to help schools reduce sodium in school meals. And then also an infographic that the American Heart Association developed, which shows you know, what it would really take to go from target one to target two sodium. And so if you look at the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see a handout section. And if you click on that, um, those materials are available for you to download. Or you can go to nanacoalition.org and find them. So for child nutrition reauthorization, so that happens every five years. The last reauthorization was in 2010, and that resulting bill was the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. We're working on the child nutrition reauthorization through the National Alliance for Nutrition and Activity, which is a coalition of about 500 organizations, which um, if you are not a member of and would like more information, um, email us. We'll give you our email at the end of the webinar. So NANA has worked on a wide range of recommendations for child nutrition reauthorization related to school food service equipment, um, expanding and strengthening farm to school, increasing reimbursement for school breakfast and for the child and adult care food program, identifying best practices around nutrition education coordination and technical assistance. And so we've worked on a number of, we have a number of recommendations that we're working to get Congress to include in the reauthorization. But one of our top priorities is to protect the continued progress in school food and to help continue um, the implementation of the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, where there are a lot of improvements. So the issues that are vulnerable in it being rolled back by Congress include calories, um, requiring that every school meal include a half a cup of fruit or vegetables, the whole grain recommendation, the a la carte standard, and sodium. And sodium is probably one of the most talked about areas, um, one of the most vulnerable to being rolled back by members of Congress. And so why we're having the webinar today, and one of the key things we're talking to members of Congress and their staff about. 
So the Senate Agriculture Committee and the House Education and Workforce Committees are writing their child nutrition bill. Now we actually have heard that the Senate plans to mark up their bill in committee September 17th. And so it seems to be moving forward. They had talked a lot about trying to get bills out in July. Um, but it looks like they actually are you know, planning to get bills out in September. They are supposed to finish the reauthorization of the child nutrition bill by October 1st, but it's relatively easy for Congress to pass an extension to give themselves more time, and that extension could be through the end of the year or it could be longer. So, um, so if folks are interested in getting involved in supporting Healthy school foods and other recommendations through um, appropriations or through the child nutrition reauthorization, we would welcome your help. The National Alliance for Nutrition and Activity has a school food subcommittee that is working together to try to keep the school nutrition standards strong and to support schools as they're moving toward um, having healthier foods, including sodium reduction. We've been educating members of Congress about a number of issues, including the science on sodium. And if you are interested in reaching out to your own members of Congress, we'd be happy to provide you with some background information. Those handouts that are on the webinar site are the core materials that we are using. Um, and we also have an action alert on our website at cspinet.org, which you could use to reach out to your own members of Congress or that you could share with your members. We also have some model social media posts that we've been pushing out around sodium last week and this week to try to educate the public a little bit more about the issue. And so if folks are interested in getting engaged, you can contact us through the webinar chat box or question box or email us and we can share some additional materials and ideas for how you could help. So with that, I am going to just remind you that if you do have questions, to type them into the question box. You can do that at any time while the speakers are presenting. And I am going to turn it over to Molly Cogswell, who is going to tell us a little bit more about kids and sodium. Molly? Thank you, Margo. Um, and we'll wait for the slides to be pulled up. I um, I appreciate this opportunity to discuss with you the science of sodium intake among U.S. school-aged children. I'm a nurse and a nutritional epidemiologist, and uh, the science around sodium reduction has become a big part of my life. So I'll go to the next slide. And the reason why I'm passionate about it is because each year nearly 800,000 people in the United States die from heart attacks, strokes, and other cardiovascular diseases. That's one in every three deaths in the United States. And about 155,000 Americans who died from cardiovascular disease in 2013 were younger than age 65. It also accounts for one in every six healthcare dollars spent in the United States for a total cost of $320 billion per year. And high blood pressure is a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease. It's estimated that about 40% of cardiovascular disease deaths in the United States are attributed to high blood pressure. Next slide. So a vast body of scientific evidence indicates that a high sodium diet can lead to high blood pressure. And this is a concern because about one in nine US children ages eight to 17 years has blood pressure above the normal range for their age. And about nine in 10 US children ages six to 18 years eat too much sodium before salt is even added at the table. Next. So how much sodium is too much? The 2010 Dietary Guidelines for Americans recommend limiting sodium intake to less than 
2,300 milligrams per day. That's about a teaspoon of salt that's already in the packaged and processed and restaurant foods when we buy them. About 75% of our sodium intake is already in processed and restaurant foods. The 2015 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, which is a group of independent experts who evaluated the scientific evidence, they, they evaluated the scientific evidence related to sodium intake and health, and they reaffirmed this level of limiting sodium intake to less than 2,300 milligrams per day. Studies indicate that less than 500 milligrams of dietary sodium per day, between 200 and 500 milligrams per day, is needed to replace losses through sweat and stool. However, it's difficult to achieve recommended intake of other nutrients with a sodium intake of 500 milligrams per day or less because of the excess amounts of sodium in commonly consumed packaged and restaurant foods. So based on an energy intake by age, the Institute of Medicine set adequate intakes for children, which you see in the second column in the chart, of 1,200 milligrams per day for children aged 4 to 8 years, 1,500 milligrams per day for children aged 19 years and older. And this was to meet the recommended intake of other nutrients. The Institute of Medicine also set tolerable upper intake levels for sodium, and these are used as a guide to limit sodium intake. Long-term daily intake above these levels can increase the potential risk for adverse health effects. Children need less food than adults, so these sodium intakes are adjusted for the amount of energy school-aged children consume, and they range from 1,900 milligrams per day for elementary-aged children to 2,300 milligrams per day for high school age children. Next slide, please. So on average, U.S. school age children are eating about 1,000 milligrams more per day than the recommended upper intake levels. That's about 3,300 milligrams per day, and that excludes salt added at the table. The sodium intake is highest among high school age children who on average eat almost 3,700 milligrams per day, which is slightly more than adults. And although teens consume somewhat more calories than younger children, the U.S. data suggests that teens are also eating more sodium per calorie or sodium dense foods. Next. About 43% of sodium eaten by our children comes from just 10 common food types. These include foods like pizza, bread and rolls, cold cuts, and cured meats. And some of these foods, like bread and rolls, may not taste salty, but kids eat a lot of them, so they add up to a lot of sodium intake. Next slide. And sodium intake is not just from one meal or one food, it adds up throughout the day. On average, U.S. children consume 15% of their sodium intake at breakfast, 30% at lunch, 39% at dinner, and then 16% from snacks throughout the day. Next, please. And it's everywhere. About 65% of the sodium children eat comes from stores, 13% from fast food restaurants, and 9% from foods obtained from school cafeterias. However, this data includes weekends and holidays and other days when U.S. children did not consume a school meal. Next. So on days children consumed a school meal, 26% of the sodium they consumed came from school cafeteria foods. This suggests that lowering the sodium content of these foods can help lower school-aged children's excess sodium intake. Next, please. And reducing excess sodium intake among U.S. children can improve their health. Next. About one in nine U.S. children, as we said before, have blood pressure that's above the normal range for their age. This means in a classroom of 18 students, two 
are at greater risk for or already have high blood pressure. And studies following the same group of children as they age indicate blood pressure tracks into the adult years and that children with blood pressure above normal are at increased risk for high blood pressure when they become adults. Further, studies show high blood pressure in children is associated with changes such as enlargening of the heart and hardening of the arteries. And in a nationally representative sample of U.S. children aged 8 to 18 years, higher blood pressure was associated with higher usual sodium intake. And this association was even stronger among overweight and obese children who were 37% of this surveyed population. Next. The good news is we can do something about this. Strong evidence from more than 100 controlled trials where people were given different levels of sodium intake and were conducted mainly in adults indicates as sodium intake is reduced, so is blood pressure. Although in children fewer, fewer trials have been conducted, the evidence from these trials, when it's combined, also indicates as sodium intake is reduced, so is blood pressure. Reductions in excess sodium intake and in high blood pressure both occurred recently among U.S. children. From 2003 through 2010, excess sodium intake declined slightly but significantly in U.S. children who were aged 4 to 13 years, and there were non-significant declines among children aged 14 to 18 years. Average intake of sodium per calorie or sodium-dense foods didn't change over this time, and this suggests the small reductions were related to less energy or calorie intake rather than eating less sodium-dense foods. From 1999 through 2012, high blood pressure also significantly declined in U.S. children by one and a half percentage points for children ages 8 to 18 years. Although lowering energy intake can help lower excess sodium intake, additional changes in eating patterns and reducing excess sodium in foods would help even more. Next. The good news is reducing the sodium levels in school meals can make a difference. About 62% of 51 million students receive a meal through the National School Lunch Program and 26% through the School Breakfast Program on average 180 days per year. The new National Nutrition Standards are projected to reduce the sodium content of meals by 25 to 50% by 2022. This could reduce average sodium intake among U.S. school-aged children if there is no replacement of sodium from other sources by 75 to 150 milligrams per day over the entire school year and all days or 220 to 440 milligrams per day on days children consume school meals. Next. Healthy school meal patterns and nutrition standards for children are based on a report from the Institute of Medicine. The Institute of Medicine recommended setting the sodium content in school meals to be consistent with the 2010 dietary guideline, as, as Margot said, of less than 2,300 milligrams per day and the tolerable upper intake levels by age and grade. These upper levels are used as a guide to limit sodium intake in specific meals as part of a child's usual daily diet. And because intake and excess of these levels can increase the risk of potential adverse health effects. The committee recommended small stepwise reductions over time in the sodium content of foods to allow children's palates to adjust and to increase the acceptability of foods with a lower sodium content. Next, please. So this fact sheet from the American Heart Association shows the stepwise approach in sodium reduction in foods by year and grade level. These targets apply to a single average meal based on the average of all meals offered over a week. 
90% of schools have met the standards for the 2014-15 school year, which represents a 10% reduction in the sodium levels for average school meal before the nutrition standards took place. The sodium targets for 2017 represent further reductions in each meal, and they're consistent with a daily sodium intake of 2,900 to 3,400 milligrams per day, so still well above the dietary guidelines. Next, please. This plate waste study shows the proportion of each meal component consumed by over 1,000 children before and after implementation of the 2014-2015 USDA standards for meals, and it occurred in four schools in Boston. The percent of entrees consumed increased as did vegetables, which are naturally low in sodium. Although the percent of fruits consumed did not change, the selection of fruits among students increased, so more children were consuming fruit. The percent of milk consumed decreased, however, this plate waste study occurred immediately after the change from flavored to plain milk in school meals, and longer term studies indicate little difference in milk consumption after children have had time to acclimate to the change. Overall, the bottom line is the new standards did not increase plate waste. Next, please. The 2017 targets call for further reductions in sodium, and as shown in this tip sheet from the American Heart Association, small changes can make a big difference. As shown in the top half of the slide, removing a pickle from a middle school lunch can reduce the amount of sodium served by 280 milligrams. The bottom part of the slide includes additional tips such as replacing regular canned diced tomatoes with no salt added diced tomatoes or reformulating recipes, for example, adding herbs and spices to rice instead of adding margarine or salt. Next slide. So school meals contribute 9% to overall sodium intake across the year, and they can serve as an example for changes at home. It's estimated that a 42% reduction in total sodium intake reduces average systolic blood pressure by 1 to 2 millimeters mercury in children. And this reduction, if maintained to adult years, could translate to a large reduction in heart attacks and strokes. Heart attacks and strokes are among the top causes of death in the United States. And even a 400 milligram reduction in average population sodium intake among adults could save up to 28,000 deaths each year and $7 billion in healthcare costs each year. Sodium reduction is an important part of the strategy to help prevent 1 million heart attacks and strokes by 2017, and we can make a difference if we work together. Next. So for more information, um, there's a list of websites included here. Recipes and tips for lowering sodium in school meals can be found at the USDA website. Um, other information and fact sheets at our cdc.gov slash salt website. Examples of successful programs for reducing sodium in communities. Um, and you can also find recipes at millionhearts at hhs.gov. And now I'd like to turn it over to Emily Callahan. Emily? Hello, can you all hear me okay? You sound great, Emily. Hello, this is Emily Callahan. Is my audio coming in clearly? Yes, the, everybody else is muted so they can't respond to you. Okay, but Yeah, we perfect. can hear you. Thank you, perfect. Um, well, thank you for the invitation to speak, and I'm pleased to be here to talk about this timely topic with you all today. And this slide deck um, contains um, more information than I'm going to have time to speak to, but I wanted to put in some extra information that you all can refer to after this webinar, um, just to give some context. 
to the topic I'm covering, which is really the interpretation of recent science on sodium and health. So this is just some of the background information. And um, you know, I'm not going to go through these slides in detail, but this is a great reference for um, what organizations are recommending around the world for sodium. And the recommendations range from all the way down to 1,200 in the UK, which is what they're aiming for um, in about 10 years, to around 2,300 here in the US. And I think that a really good um, overarching point is that even though there's a little bit of difference in these recommendations, um, the, they're all about 1,000 milligrams lower um, than where we are right now um, on, on our current intake. So the debate around what the ultimate a lower level is should not delay or derail us from taking steps now to start inching down to get at least somewhere in the ballpark of those levels. Um, this slide shows the data on adults, and I know uh, Dr. Cogswell covered the ones in children, but this just goes to show that adults um, ha are eating, you know, they're excessively consuming sodium just the same as kids. And they, um, people are trying to cut back. So I, I added in some data from some recent surveys. And I think the key takeaway point here is that people are concerned about the sodium they're eating. Um, actually, in an IFIC survey, they gave people the choice of a, a several dozen ingredients and in foods. And sodium was the number two ingredient people said they were trying to avoid. So I think that the work that's going on in schools um, you know, as the food supply gets lower in sodium to accommodate school's needs, if those products can be made for schools, then they can certainly be made for the general population as well. And it appears that that would meet um, the need that people have expressed in the survey data that they are trying to eat less sodium. So um, as Dr. Cogswell mentioned, most of the sodium in our diet is, is not from the salt shaker. Um, and these are the top 10 foods that contribute in adults. They're very similar to the top 10 foods in children. So I, what I really want to spend most of my time talking about is um, providing some context and explanation for some of the recent sodium research that has produced conflicting results. And this is really timely given the language in some recent congressional spending bills that's referenced a conflicted state of the science about sodium and health. And um, this could really have a, a potential significant impact on the language that is used in nutrition policy. So um, this is really about over the past two years, there have been a number of observational studies published that suggest that the sodium intake levels that are being recommended, you know, which I had mentioned on a prior slide, are around 1,500 to 2,300 here in the US. Um, that those levels might actually increase risk of adverse health outcomes, especially in, in certain populations. So this is what some of these studies have suggested. And this naturally has led to confusion about what the intake targets should be. And it's even caused some to question whether we need to reduce our current sodium intakes at all. So just as an example, I pulled a few media headlines, and there's many more like this. But you can see that it's sort of a he said, she said, uh, salt is good today, it's not good tomorrow. And you know, honestly, this it's not too, too surprising that the media has really been running away with the headlines. Um, on some of the newer research because it's a departure from the status quo. And the status quo, um, it, it can be boring. And you know the media outlets that are covering these stories are, are much more likely to get more clicks and more eyeballs on the piece if it's something that's a little edgy and controversial. So I think often the headlines um, have gone beyond what the research has actually suggested. And it can be really challenging to interpret the results of observational studies because it depends on what types of data are collected or not collected in the way that that data is analyzed by the researchers. And the way that I've heard um, one particular researcher who works in the area of sodium and health describe some of this research is that it's just a methodologic landmine. Um, there's a number of issues that can contribute to the inconsistency and in some of the results in these studies that are looking at sodium intake and, and heart disease and death outcomes. And some of these studies are using data sets that weren't even specifically designed to test that relationship. 
um, they're just taking an existing data set and doing a secondary analysis um, on what it might suggest for sodium and health, and this isn't always the best way to do it um, to really get a, a definitive answer on that question. So um, I'm going to give you a couple examples of some of the methodology issues just so you can get a flavor for it, and I'll try not to get too much into the weeds here. Um, but one key issue is uh, using a less accurate measure of sodium intake. So we want to do a pretty good job of knowing how much sodium people are eating. And this is, this is very difficult um, because sodium intakes vary a ton throughout the day, um, from day to day, from week to week. And some of the research that has suggested that um, our sodium intakes aren't a problem, they have used um, one of these less accurate measures, which is a spot urine or a single urine sample. So you can understand why this isn't really a great measure to predict a health outcome that's occurring decades later if you just take one point in time. Um, what would be preferred in the gold standard measure is um, a 24-hour urine collection and, and multiple 24-hour urine collections, but this is, of course, a much greater burden on both the participants and the study investigator, so shortcuts are often used. But it is worth noting that they have done 24-hour urine collections in the UK, and I believe that in the NHANES study here in the US, the 24-hour urines were collected on a subset of participants, um, and I, I believe we're still waiting results from that. But that just goes to show that it can be done, and that's really what we would prefer. So um, to give an example of how a study might be affected by using different measures of sodium, I've cited two different studies here, and one of them used the spot urines, and with that measure, they found a greater risk of death in heart disease events when sodium intakes were between 3,000 and 6,000 milligrams a day, which is right about where we are on average. Well, another study used multiple 24-hour urines, and they found something pretty much opposite, that um, there would be a reduced risk of cardiovascular outcomes with intakes under 3,000 milligrams a day. So you see here that the way that sodium intake was measured really can have a big difference on the result that you observe. Um, another issue is reverse causality. So this is certainly not unique to sodium research, but um, this is where you have a large sample of people, and um, people in that sample are sick. So they have some sort of chronic disease, and um, when you have some sort of disease, you're often advised by a healthcare professional to change your diet. So in this case, there were a lot of people um, in the sample of some of these studies who um, were, were ill and they were probably cutting back based on medical advice or perhaps they just weren't eating much at all because they felt sick. So these people, of course, are going to have lower sodium intakes than a lot of the other folks and they're going to have poor health outcomes. But we don't know for sure if it's because they're eating less sodium or if it's because of the disease they already had. Um, so this can um, cause some confounding in research results. Another thing is that um, there might not be enough people who have had a cardiovascular or other um, disease event to, to know for sure whether it was really because of a low-salt diet. So um, this just speaks to the need to sufficiently power a study, um, you know, and that's on the burden of the researcher to make sure they've designed it correctly in order um, to be able to give some credence to the results. Another related issue is that um, it's very expensive to do really high quality sodium research in humans, and by that I mean things like a controlled feeding study where you're getting um, a large number of people and you're putting them on a controlled diet so you know exactly how much sodium they're eating um, and you're able to follow them for a long period of time because some of these outcomes that we're interested in, like hypertension or um, heart attack or, or heart failure and death, those take a very long time to develop. So you need to follow people for a long period of time and, and keep them on a diet for a while. And that um, is just known to not be very feasible. Um, it's something that's very difficult for research to do, and it, it costs a lot of money to do that. So um, that, those would be the ideal types of studies that we would have. But um, you know, we do have some research that has been very controlled with 
feeding studies, and that's really um, given us a lot of definitive evidence that links sodium to high blood pressure. I mean, there have been a couple of other studies that looked at um, events down the line, but um, this is just an issue that is um, unique. It's not unique to sodium. It, it really affects other uh, research on nutrition and health. So just to kind of summarize, these methodological issues in sodium research are very common, and uh, an empirical analysis of these issues looked at over two dozen cohort or observational studies that looked at the relationship between sodium and health. Um, you know, and a number of these studies were the ones that were saying that we, you know, our sodium intakes aren't the problem, and we don't want to go any lower. A, a lot of those studies had a number of methodological problems in them. So actually, multiple national and international organizations have called for setting of research standards for clinical and population research on sodium. And this is really important because only carefully conducted and rigorous research will further the scientific literature and be suitable for informing public policy. So just a few implications and, and summary points are that um, a lot of methodology issues limit the usefulness of some of these new studies for drawing conclusions about sodium and health and specifically for guiding public policy decisions. So when you are interpreting the results of a study, it's important to not just read um, a news article about it, but ideally to try to get a copy of that study um, and to examine you, what kind of population they were using, the measures they used, um, to think about how it fits in with the rest of the literature. And um, you know, it's OK if it, if it doesn't exactly match everything that has been published before. That's how science evolves and we learn new things and, and see how um, things change over time. But um, I think it's important to consider a lot of different things as you're assessing a study. Um, for sodium and health, um, the evidence that we think is really the best is those clinical trials of sodium intake and blood pressure. Um, a number of those have very carefully controlled what people are eating and, and very, very rigorously controlled um, the measure of sodium um, those people were consuming. And those really provide um, the strongest scientific basis to guide policy, um, according to the American Heart Association and others. So I think it's really important for health and nutrition professionals to consider that public health recommendations are made after weighing all of the evidence. Just because you know one or two new studies come out and, and say something different, that doesn't mean that we abandon um, our, our current recommendations, which are, are based on a, a very broad um, collection of science. Um, we have to consider everything. So some studies might have greater or lesser strength of design, and some might have conflicting results. But we really need to consider all of them as a whole and, and go ahead and make our policy and public health recommendations from there. So based on the weight of the evidence, the American Heart Association and a number of other major international and national public health and science groups are continuing to recommend reducing sodium intake from the levels we're currently eating right now. And just a few additional points are that the public health burden of high blood pressure is really staggering. Um, and this warrants that we treat people that already have high blood pressure, but also that we do all we can to prevent it. And as Dr. Codwell shared, um, heart disease begins in children. And it's really important that um, we focus on what we can do when kids are young and when they're forming eating habits. Um, there's not a whole lot of debate about lowering sodium intake to 2,300 milligrams a day. I, you know, I mentioned a couple other studies um, that had suggested it should be higher. But um, I also covered some of the major methodological issues that limit the usefulness of some of those studies for guiding policy. Um, much less reversing the, the recommendations we've come to. So um, the American Heart Association believes that the prevailing recommendations, for example, in the 2015 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee report, would align with the best evidence on sodium and health. And um, there are a number of modeling projections and estimates that, that look at the benefits we could achieve from reducing sodium in the food supply. Um, and there's really a significant impact both on health outcomes and health care costs there. 
Um, so just to conclude, um, this is my last slide. There was a paper published um, just about two weeks ago in the Journal of Clinical Hypertension. Um, and I had the privilege of working on this paper um, with several scientists um, and other AHA staff who are active in this field. And um, a, a key conclusion of that paper was that the available data are absolutely sufficiently strong enough to recommend lower sodium intake starting early in life as an effective approach for reducing blood pressure in children, and that any efforts to weaken nutrition standards for school meals really undermine um, and the effective strategy that would be um, because it really has potential to improve the health of our kids and our nation. Um, thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Great. Thank you, Emily and Molly. Um, I, we have some questions, which I will get to in just a second. But just to remind folks, if you have questions, if you click on the question bar, um, it'll pop open and you can type in your questions. And we will try to get to as many of them as we can before 1 o'clock. Um, so the first question, um, I think any of you could answer, um, would just to, would be to go over the sodium levels again for school meals. And I'll just point people to the handouts. Um, if you also click on the little plus sign um, for handouts, you'll see that there are four handouts here. There's um, an infographic from USDA. There is um, a really helpful handout from the Heart Association, which talks about what it takes to go from target one to target two sodium levels. There's the science on sodium, and then there's a list of products that companies have already reformulated and made available to schools, just showing that reformulation is underway. But I don't know, Emily, do you want to review um, kind of a maybe looking at lunch? You know, what kind of sodium reduction are we talking about going from target one to two to three for schools? Um, sure. So. Uh, Dr. Cogswell referenced an AHA um, infographic in her presentation, and I don't have that in front of me right now, but um, if memory serves me correctly, I believe that um, schools right now are allowed to include um, around 1,200 milligrams of sodium in a lunch, and of course that varies um, for grade level, um, but you know, when we were creating that infographic at the AHA and doing some food swaps and looking at how some relatively easy switches could really have a big impact on the sodium levels in schools, we found that, um, you know, a few simple things like, you know, removing a pickle or even serving a smaller pickle um, could have a big impact. And, um, you know, ultimately, you know, as you know, there are three phases that have been uh, suggested in the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act to lower sodium in school meals. And you know, even the ultimate phase, which wouldn't go into effect until the school year 2022, 2023, um, although that number looks pretty low, um, especially compared to where we are now, um, it is based on children getting 2,300 milligrams over the whole day because, of course, kids are eating other times besides just the school lunch. Um, so that 2,300 milligrams, again, is um, a daily maximum limit. So the tier three uh, school lunch value would, would fit right in nicely, knowing that kids are going to be eating breakfast, dinner, and um, maybe a couple snacks throughout the day. Great. And so for either one of you, um, how strong is the data about sodium reduction and blood pressure? Is the controversy primarily around heart disease outcomes? And why is it harder to look at heart disease versus blood pressure? I can address that if it would be helpful. And then Emily, you want to jump in? Yes. OK. So in terms of the research related to sodium reduction and blood pressure, there's an incredibly strong body of evidence. There's, in the most recent analysis that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine um, by Dariush Mansafarian, 
he looked at over a hundred randomized controlled trials in um, people aged from 13 up to I believe around 75 across the world and found this dose response relationship which means that as sodium intake is lowered so is blood pressure and it was a linear dose response relationship so it means means that for every, for example, a thousand milligram reduction in sodium intake, there's a corresponding reduction in blood pressure. In kids, the evidence, there aren't as many trials. It's more difficult to conduct this type of trial in kids. There's a really nice um, systematic review and meta-analysis of the trials in children that was conducted by the World Health Organization um, and published in I believe the British Medical Journal and that's uh, also referenced in the slides that I have and in those trials when they are combined together because some of them are smaller than others and when you have a smaller sample size it's much more difficult to find um, a clinically significant difference so when they're combined they also show that as you reduce sodium intake you reduce blood pressure. So overall the evidence is incredibly strong in adults and there's moderate evidence in, in kids and there's no reason to believe that the evidence in adults does not apply to children as well. In terms of heart disease outcomes it's much more difficult to assess um, heart disease outcomes because they occur in a smaller proportion of the population is still incredibly common but not as common as high blood pressure uh, which occurs in about 30 percent of US adults and then another about a third of Americans are, have elevated blood pressure or prehypertension putting them at risk of cardiovascular disease um, and you have to follow uh, adults or children over time, um, usually for a fairly long period of time for those outcomes to begin. So maintaining people on a low sodium diet, particularly in this food environment where it's difficult for an ordinary person or even someone highly motivated to reduce their sodium intake is extraordinarily difficult. Yet there have been randomized controlled trials um, where they have followed up people with outcomes and there's an, a nice meta-analysis of those or a Cochrane review which also suggests that as you reduce sodium intake you can reduce cardiovascular disease. The issue is that you need a lot more people to, and you need to follow them up over time and so again the sample sizes aren't quite what we would want. Um, observational studies, as Emily mentioned, are, are much more difficult. There was a, um, I'm just going on and on, but there was a, uh, a recent study looking at assessment of sodium intake uh, from dietary measures related to 24-hour uh, urines. And what it shows is that for sodium, it's much more difficult to measure sodium with dietary measures, for example, than potassium because what we eat from day to day varies tremendously and there's about a, a two-fold higher difference in our day-to-day -day sodium intake than there is between, say, me and Margo and our sodium intake, our long-term average sodium intake overall. So it's very difficult to capture with a measure on one day and even a spot urine or a 24-hour urine is just a very short-term indicator of sodium intake. It, it measures what we consumed in the last 24 or 48 hours and it's not a good measure of our long-term sodium intake. So I'll stop there because I've been talking for a long time, but um, I hope that addresses some of the issues. That, yeah, that's that really wonderful. wonderful. I wonder if the next step from there is then for people who are really wanting to see data, you know, I've heard from companies, from members of Congress, from some organizations, they really want to see most of the data, be, you know, disease outcomes, people getting heart attacks or having strokes, wondered how strong is the link 
between high blood pressure and cardiovascular disease. So that's an incredibly strong link, and again, a meta-analysis of, um, uh, I'd have to go back and give you the numbers, and I'm going to give you the wrong numbers, but it, if I'm remembering co correctly, hundreds of thousands of people with the observational studies um, looking at a sodium intake not sodium intake, as blood pressure goes higher, so does the risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, and if you lower blood pressure, so in randomized control trials where they lower blood pressure with medication, you can reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. And I don't think, I really don't think many people question that. Yeah, I would agree. This is Emily, and um, I would say it's pretty rock solid, the link between high blood pressure and heart disease, and, and that's why the American Heart Association, as well as other groups, are pouring a lot of effort into um, preventing and treating high blood pressure. No, that's good to know. Um, there's another question here. Is the political debate regarding sodium causing manufacturers to delay reformulation of their products, or is that a concern? Some manufacturers are making reductions in the sodium content of their foods, and we really applaud those manufacturers, and we hope that more follow their example. And um, I think there was a nice handout with some of the reductions in the sodium in some of the foods, in school foods, uh, and that could be used as an example. I, I think, um, you know, from our perspective policy-wise at CSPI and I think among other members of NANA, that there is concern that if Congress keeps delaying the, the, the implementation of Target 2 sodium levels or keep saying it, it may not happen, there's a lot of uncertainty around it. We are concerned that some school districts will stop working towards sodium reduction thinking that it's not going to happen so they don't need to do it. And that some companies also will hope that Congress will continue to block that target to sodium level. And so we are worried that this continued year after year delay around target to sodium will be a barrier to both school districts and food manufacturers reformulating. Because it just, just creates a lot of uncertainty. This, this is Emily, and um, I appreciate that. And I, I am aware that you know there are a few districts, I don't know numbers, but I believe that um, there are some schools out there that are meeting target to. Um, you know, I don't know if they've got it down perfect, but I think that you know, to those type of schools that have already done all the work to then go back and say, oh, you know, you actually didn't need to do that is a problem and, you know, they should certainly be rewarded for their efforts. And I, I think that I've, um, in my monitoring of the, the landscape for the market of sodium reduction ingredients, there are um, a number of companies that are producing different types of salts and uh, salt alternative products that they are actively selling into the food service and restaurant space. Um, and um, from what I have heard, business is, is going very well. And the market for those type of ingredients is valued to be at around a billion dollars over the next few years. And it's continued to grow. So um, I think that that's great innovation. And some of the technologies I have seen recently didn't exist a couple of years ago. And they've made all sorts of possibilities. <laughs> Um, be an option, and I think that uh, we certainly want to continue to foster that, um, you know, and not stifle that. And there's a lot going on in in R and D and um, food technology, and um, I think that it's great that it's progressing. And um, we certainly don't want um, some of the the debate right now in Congress around school meals to stifle that innovation. So let's try to squeeze in one last question before we wrap up. Um, could one of you clarify the controversy around the 2013 IOM report about, does that report say that people shouldn't lower their sodium 
um, what, is, what is the difference in their recommendations around 1,500 milligrams of sodium versus 2,300 milligrams of sodium? I think many people interpreted that report as it may be dangerous or not recommended to go to low sodium, but how low is low? I can I could try to address that in terms of the IOM 2013 report. What they chose to focus on was sodium intake and direct health outcomes. And as uh, I was talking about before, these are studies that are more difficult um, to conduct. And as, as Emily said in her presentation, and so there's a lot of methodologic issues with those studies and they emphasized that as well. So uh, in terms of those studies, they did say overall the conclusion is that we should be reducing sodium intake. What they said was that the evidence for reducing sodium intake less than 2300 down to 1500 is not as strong in relation to health outcomes, so the direct health outcomes. However, the evidence in relation to blood pressure is strong and consistent, and as a population, we would benefit from reducing our sodium intake. Um, that said, some of the studies that were included in the report, especially those on congestive heart failure, have since been retracted because the investigators um, could not find the data when asked. So there were some studies among people with congestive heart failure that showed if they were given on a low sodium diet um, and they were on medication regimens that we don't have in the United States. So they're on a low sodium diet and medication regimens we don't have in the United States um, that they had increased risk of heart disease outcomes. Those data were since retracted uh, because one of the investigators, when contacted, couldn't find the data, they'd been lost. So I think we have to, it just goes to show that we have to be really careful uh, about the data and the data that we're evaluating. There was a really nice um, editorial written by the chairman and some of the committee members reiterating that Overall, we need to reduce sodium in the population and the levels of 2,300 milligrams per day make sense. They also said for those with prehypertension, um, they could benefit from reducing levels even lower than 2,300 milligrams per day. I just have one thing to add there. Um, you know, I think there definitely was a lot of confusion after the report, and there was actually so much confusion and um, so many kind of far-reaching media headlines that it prompted the president at the time of the IOM to send a letter to the Secretary of Health and Human Services um, to reiterate that the support um, that the, the report did support um, reducing sodium at, at least down to 2,300 milligrams a day. Um, so that that was not really in question, and you know, and as we discussed, that number is very far from where we are now. Um, so I think that report um, does support continuing to reduce from our current levels. Yeah, and some of this controversy, people talking about low sodium, they're really talking about pretty moderate sodium levels. That getting to 2,300 mm -hmm. milligrams is not in question. Is what school lunch recommendations are based on, and is far from low in sodium. You know, it's plenty to provide for children's physiologic needs. So with that, I am going to thank our speakers again, and thanks to all of you who um, listened in to the webinar. I hope it did help to clear up some of the confusion about sodium reduction and the need for it in children. We will send a link to all of you who registered with um, a link to the recording, a recording of the webinar, which will include the slides and the handout. So again, thanks to our speakers and thanks to everyone who attended.